Good morning. Welcome to today, uh, today's event on renewing American industrial policy. My name is Martin Rasser, Senior Fellow and Director of the Technology and National Security Program here at CNAS. Today's discussion is the culmination of a year-long project to lay out the intellectual framework for a new American industrial policy. What that would look like in an area in an era of strategic competition with technology at the center. The goal is to pave the way for enhanced and sustained American competitiveness and technological leadership. In all, we published five reports as part of this effort, an initial intellectual framework, a deep dive into the US toolkit, and three case studies, one on biotechnology, semiconductors, and clean energy technology. The authors of these case studies are here with us today to discuss their findings and their policy recommendations. Moderating the discussion are my colleagues, Alexandra Seymour, Associate Fellow in the Technology and National Security Program, and Emily Chin, Research Assistant in the Energy, Economics, and Security Program. So with that, let me turn to Alexandra to get things rolling. Alexandra, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Martin, for that great overview of our project. Um, as Martin said, my name is Alexandra Seymour. I am with the Technology and National Security Program where I'm an associate fellow. And I am really, really thrilled um, to get to introduce our speakers today and to kick off our discussion. As Martin mentioned, um, they wrote all of our reports, uh, the case studies, um, the biotech, the clean energy, uh, and the semiconductor report. Um, so first, we have Chris Miller. He is an assistant professor of international history at the Fletcher School at Tufts University and co-director of the school's Russia and Eurasia program. He's also a Jean Kirkpatrick visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on Russian, uh, Russia, Eurasia, and the geopolitics of technology, namely semiconductors. Um, notably, he just recently released his newest book, which is called Chip War, um, which details the geopolitical history of the computer chip. And he is the author of our report, Rewire Semiconductors in U.S. Industrial Policy. Next, we have Jonas Nam, who is an assistant professor of energy, resources, and environment at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. His research interests focus on the intersection of economic and industrial policy, energy policy, and environmental politics, specifically looking at the role of states in industrial restructuring that accompany policy responses to climate change and the green energy transition. He's the author of the report, Reimagine, Clean Energy Technology and U.S. Industrial Policy. And finally, we have Ryan Fedashuk. He's an adjunct fellow with the Technology and National Security Program here at the Center for a New American Security. In addition to being an adjunct fellow at CNAS, Ryan is currently detailed as a China Tech Policy Advisor in the Office of China Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Ryan completed all contributions to his CNAS report, Regenerate, prior to joining the State Department. The views he will express today are his alone and are in no way informed by his work for the State Department. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the U.S. government. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, we, are, we are thrilled to have you. And uh, as you all can see, we have a, a great wealth of knowledge on this call with us today. Um, so I'd like to dive right in and I'd like to turn to you first, Chris, um, and I'll go through and make sure that you all, all have an opportunity to answer this question. Um, but broadly speaking, um, how should policymakers, industry stakeholders, and the average citizen think about this shift to U.S. industrial policy? Chris? Well, thanks, Alexandra, for the opportunity to, to share some thoughts this morning. I think the issue of industrial policy is a, a complex one uh, to manage because in all of the spheres that we're going to discuss today, uh, government plays a role in uh, research and development and setting up a broader uh, ecosystem for companies to grow, but it's also the case that in all of the spheres we are going to discuss today, the private sector is the key driver in commercialization. And as we think through what a new industrial policy might entail, I think it's important not to lose uh, sight of the importance of striking the right balance. And historically, I think uh, government policies towards advanced industries have worked when they recognize the importance of governments, but also the real limits of government. Uh, in in understanding what and how to commercialize. So that's that's the first thing to realize is that uh, discussion of industrial policy uh, shouldn't be seen as a as a, 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 
uh, as a sort of recognition that government can solve all the problems. And in fact, a key, a, a key to success of, of industrial policy is to recognize uh, limits and to draw boundaries between uh, what the private sector is expected to do and will do and what the government can do to help. The second thing I'd say is that in the context of our conversation today, in, industrial policy is merited not only, and I would say not even primarily by a desire to, uh, to boost the particular firms involved or to drive forward innovation for its own sake, but in the context of a broader national security discussion. And, and in the case of semiconductors, for example, uh, one of the reasons this issue has come to the fore in American political debate is not because there's a deficit of innovation, there's clearly not, not because U.S. firms are unprofitable, they're generally not, um, not because the U.S. role in the industry has uh, dramatically decayed, it really hasn't, um, but rather because there are new national security challenges uh, that implicate the industry and that the U.S. government needs the industry to uh, be shaped in certain ways to achieve its national security goals. And, and this is something different from other, other uses of industrial policy, which are focused on saving an industry, for example, or boosting innovation. That's not what we're talking about when it comes to semiconductors, where the industry is highly successful, highly profitable, uh, and by most metrics, the uh, most um, advanced in the world, not all metrics, but most metrics. Uh, and so here, I think it's crucial to keep national security goals in mind. What is it that we're trying to accomplish uh, and how can we best accomplish uh, these goals? And in the case of semiconductors, I would put forward uh, two goals for industrial policy from a national security perspective. The first is limiting the concentration uh, of certain steps in the semiconductor production process above all manufacturing uh, in geopolitical hotspots in East Asia. And second, ensuring that the U.S. government has access to the semiconductors that it needs for uh, security and military purposes. And, uh, and I think these two goals are very important to keep in mind because they do help to limit the scope of what we're actually trying to focus on. And the more we're able to focus industrial policy, the more likely it is to succeed. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, I'm going to go on to Jonas next if you'd like to answer this question as well. Yeah, maybe I'll take a different sort of angle on, on this question, also being informed by a very different industrial sort of uh, background in, in my case study. But I think one of the things I would say is that um, the U.S. in fact has had an industrial policy for clean energy industries for a long time. On the one hand, um, focusing on creating um, sort of more innovation in the space and funding R&D. The U.S. is one of the largest uh, funders of R&D historically in, in clean energy sectors. And on the other hand, um, funding or, or using regulatory support for clean energy markets domestically. So, you know, requiring utilities to buy wind and solar power and, and so on. I think what's changed over time is that this uh, sort of combination of industrial policies hasn't really yielded the kinds of domestic outcomes that we have hoped to get in return for these investments. And so the kinds of manufacturing industries that we've often hoped we would get um, haven't materialized domestically quite quite in the way that that uh, policymakers expected and and a big part of that is um sort of you know a restructuring of the global economy and globalization sort of enabling uh firms to essentially take innovation from here and manufacturing it elsewhere and then bringing it back and so i think um thinking about this shift to industrial policy or i think that's the way you phrased it really is a, is a way of thinking about how do we um, improve the domestic industrial policy landscape that that hasn't yielded the kinds of outcomes that we wanted in the past um, and tweak it um, to make it sort of more productive and more in line with what we want. And so that has, of course, um, political implications. I think it's very hard to justify investments in these industries if we don't see domestic returns. It, it has um, economic implications. People can work and have jobs in these sectors in ways that, that currently they don't have enough. And it, of course, has security implications. If, um, a lot of these technologies are now produced elsewhere in the world, and we can bring some of that back to the U.S. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, and Ryan, I will turn to you uh, to answer this question as well. It's uh, it's hard to top um, Chris and Jonas's comments. Uh, the only thing I would add to this question, why industrial policy, um, are, are, are two key facets, right? So one, uh, is supply chain concerns. I think the national security strategy that the Biden administration released last week uh, is very clear that it is taking into consideration, really in the first time in the history of these kinds of documents, uh, potential risks to supply chain disruptions. Uh, 
and the potential uh, for U.S. competitors and adversaries to coerce other states. This is now a national security concern where it hadn't been before. Uh, I think people are very fond of saying, for example, that economic security is national security. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, a pivotal moment in the history of the United States where the U.S. government is actually adopting that mentality uh, and, and deciding to act on it. Uh, but the, the second thing I would posit to you um, is that uh, free markets are essential to our innovation model. They are the backbone of the American science and technology system. Uh, I think the national security strategy document outlines that as well. Uh, but the document also clarifies uh, that there are certain gaps in markets. Uh, I think, you know, just speaking from my own opinion, um, nowhere is this more clear than in cyberspace and in the digital economy, right? The United States uh, has really become the engine uh, of the world digital economy because we have a, a free market and an, innov and an innovation system that rewards low risk, incremental risk takers. Uh, and this has been tremendously beneficial uh, to the American people and to the world economy. But when you're talking about pushing the bounds of science itself in physics, in chemistry, in biology, in aerospace, uh, you need big investments, big risks, uh, often in sectors that are not ready to be commercialized. Uh, and when you're deciding to take a risk that that's, that's that large, uh, you really do need uh, the support of some behemoth behind you uh, to, to, to advance uh, investment in that kind of science and technology, to push the bounds of what's possible and to create markets where none currently exist. That's, I think, a core reason why uh, we're seeing this debate about and this openness to some form of industrial policy. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Um, really, really good framing comments that kind of bring us to where we are. Um, I'd actually like to turn back to you, Jonas, um, since you were the one that had said, this actually isn't something new, that we've had industrial policy in America, um, but now we're just looking at ways to improve it. I think that Chris and Ryan brought up some great points as well about how we really need to make sure that we are um, focusing on our free market principles, because that is one thing that does make us unique uh, in America. But um, I'd like to turn to you to just kind of hear your thoughts about what you think makes a unique American brand of industrial policy and how, as we're looking to improve it, um, that we can make sure that we're contrasting any authoritarian approaches to industrial policy. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that first, uh, and then I'll turn it over to the other two as well to make sure that uh, Chris and Ryan have a chance to weigh in. I think that's a great question, and I think it's one that in some ways touches on some of the misconceptions that I think are out there about industrial policy. I think a lot of sort of thinking and academic literature um, about industrial policy historically comes out of fairly centralized sort of political context in East Asia, um, you know, kind of late economic development context, and then China has been a very heavy user of industrial policy, of course, recently. And so um, I think we sort of associated with a certain kind of government um, approach and and I think that um, there's a lot more diversity out there in terms of industrial policy approaches, right? So so China uses lots of market-based industrial policies to support its domestic electric vehicle industry. Um, there are kind of liberal market economies that use much more top-down industrial policy approaches as well. A lot of that depends on what you're trying to achieve if you're trying to catch up with others you can benchmark you can set targets because you know where these others are and in clean energy industries um, all of us are catching up to someone else in some ways and all of us are also at the technological frontier in some ways and so we can't benchmark in those situations we have to you know explore and, and kind of support that kind of innovation and so i think um a great way to think about uh, industrial policy is to, to make it very problem specific and to use a very wide range of tools for very different challenges that you face in different sectors, subsectors at different stages and be very explicit about, you know, what the market failures are, what the reasons are for why the government uh, should get involved and, and you know, sort of justify transparently in those terms. And so I think that would um, maybe remove some of that sort of author authoritarian kind of centralized top down um, uh, reputation or sort of, you know, connotation of industrial policy and make it much more, 
um, sector specific and, and you know, very consciously provide us with a toolkit of different kinds of things that we can use depending on different kinds of situations that we find ourselves in. Great. Um, Ryan, I'd like to turn over to you on this one as well. Um, just, just curious what you think makes a unique brand of American industrial policy. I know that you just mentioned in your remarks as well, um, some of the sector specific concerns that we need to keep in mind. Sure. Well, I, I think, you know, it's important to start with the bottom line and meet people where they are. You know, industrial policy is inefficient relative to the free market period. Right, because you are directing, you know, to some degree, uh, uh, where investments ought to go, or, or, you know, there's a concern basically that we are picking and choosing uh, winners and losers, uh, and this is exactly the end state that we want to avoid. I think uh, when we talk about something like industrial policy, uh, the way you can do that in a democratic fashion, in a way that is uh, American branded, plays to our our strengths, our historic strengths. Uh, is by allowing the market to still be the dominant force, uh, but by shepherding investments that would otherwise occur uh, in, in targeted ways, diluting risks in those industries. I think uh, Jonas was exactly right in his comment, um, but I would just take it a step further and, and say, you know, we need to be wielding a, a scalpel and not a sledgehammer uh, and allowing for very uh, targeted uh, uh, tools and institutions uh, that then allow the market to play to its own advantages, um, because that's something that the United States has historically been very successful at. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and Chris, I'll turn to you. I think you made a similar point in your remarks about the limitations of government and how we need to recognize that. Now, also recognizing the national security concerns, which you also emphasized, um, and seeing how the U.S. is starting to embrace this new type of uh, brand of industrial policy? How can we make sure that we do maintain that uh, American unique spirit? Well, I think there are, are, are a couple of things. First, I would say is to, to articulate very clearly what our goals are. Um, and I mentioned this at the outset, but I think it's absolutely important. And our conversation already has um, brought up a number of different potential industrial policy goals in different spheres. And I think there's probably uh, different goals uh, we'd have depending on which sector of the economy uh, we're looking at. But we've got to be very explicit as to what we're trying to accomplish. Are we trying to uh, increase the amount of research and development happening in the sphere? Are we trying to de-risk a sector from certain security aims? Because the policy tools you'll use in those directions are very, very different. And I do worry that uh, sometimes in Washington, uh, phrases like industrial policy are used without definitions attached to them in ways that muddle our understanding uh, rather than promote it. So I think that would be uh, number one. That's not anything specifically American, but I think it's crucial to, um, to policy success. I think uh, number two is to, again, think about historically what has government done well and what has it done poorly. I think uh, we can identify many ways in which government has played a role in supporting uh, innovation, especially at the technological frontier in all three of the industries that we're looking at today. So that's clearly an area where government can play a role. Um, certainly government plays a role in assessing security risks and thinking about uh, the ramifications of them and how to address them. That's certainly something. When it comes to scaling businesses, I think there's more questions about when and where the government uh, can play a role. Certainly. Uh, in certain spheres at certain times, government can be supportive, but in other spheres, I think government has been uh, less effective and in some cases even uh, detrimental to taking a technology and scaling it to a, a widespread product. And, and I think the specifics matter a lot here. I, and I think the defense industry is an interesting case study, both in defense electronics, where I've spent a lot of time looking, but also more generally, where on the one hand, we see the government having played a huge role in I mean, a defense innovations, the fundamental role in driving forward defense. But if you also look at defense industry today, you'll find a pretty sclerotic set of firms that have been in their place for a long time that struggle to offer or justify the cost benefit of, of what they're producing. And so um, that's industrial policy in action too, but it's not the type of industrial policy that we want. So uh, I, I guess at the at, at the conclusion, I think we need to focus on our goals, articulating what they are, and then thinking what are the policy tools we have to achieve them and not assume that any specific set of policy tools is going to work in every different context. Thank you, Chris. 
Um, I'd like to first just quickly remind our audience that we you can submit questions at any point, so please make sure that you're sending them in. Um, I have a question for Ryan specifically. Um, so, of course, we've heard a lot of talk about the Chips and Science Act, um, which was passed a couple months ago. Uh, and this is earmarked crucial funding for sustaining American Edge in, in R&D and in workforce development, uh, going off uh, what Chris just said about research and development. Now, Ryan, you wrote the report on biotechnology, and I think that that's starting to come up a lot more. Um, do you think that there uh, is a case for uh, a, CHIPS, a CHIPS Act for biotechnology or, or something along those lines? Uh, what are your thoughts on how we should approach uh, this issue and some of the findings that you had in your report? Sure. I think um, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think that we're poised for uh, some CHIPS Act-like action uh, in biotechnology in the near term, next one year, two year, five year period or so. Uh, I think it will be up to Congress to, to act on this because really what's needed is funding, uh, codification of uh, expanded uh, uh, authorities, allowing people to stay in the United States, uh, lifting, for example, the H-1B visa cap and a bunch of other activities that ultimately reside in the power of the Congress of the United States. Um, but on, on the question of why, why biotechnology and why now, uh, I do want to echo Chris's concerns um, that I don't think the United States government should be trying uh, to scale uh, the biotechnology sector. This is not typically a role uh, that governments have had or that governments have succeeded in. Uh, but where governments can succeed, uh, to echo his point, is in pushing the boundaries of what's possible in very basic science and technology. And I, it, it feels to me uh, like we are really at the ankle of um, this exponential curve uh, in what will become possible in emerging and foundational biotechnologies, um, unlocking new synthetic materials that could be the basis of sectors that uh, we can't even fathom yet. Um, and I, I think this is exactly the moment uh, where it's really important that the United States try to take the lead and maintain the lead uh, in creating those foundational technologies and, and basic science and technology. But again, it will take a massive infusion of capital, uh, the scale uh, of which would be similar to the CHIPS Act. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so for Chris and Jonas, I have a slightly different question. Um, something that I'd like to ask you both, and I'll, I'll go to Chris on this one first. Uh, as we're thinking about industrial policy and, and you know, keeping all these factors that you all have laid out in mind and you've dug into them in your individual case studies, I think another important component of this is to recognize the role that our allies and partners play. Um, I'd like to turn to Chris on this first. Uh, I know that this is something, especially with uh, enhancing supply chain resiliency, we've looked for ways to work with allies and partners. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts about uh, the ways in which you think it would be best uh, for us to work together. Well, I, I think answering that question uh, again requires turning to um, the the issue of what specifically we're trying to accomplish in this sphere. I think if you're looking at um, supporting innovation, for example, there already are um, a, a fair number of international connections between U.S. firms and research institutes, European, Japanese, Taiwanese, et cetera, in the semiconductor space. And so well, I'm sure there's more that can be done. I, I don't worry that much about a deficit um, in, in that sphere. Um, when it comes to supply chain resiliency, um, you know, I look at the semiconductor industry as a case study in resilient supply chains. During the pandemic, the first year of the pandemic, the chip industry produced 8% more chips than the prior year. And then during 2021, the second year of the pandemic, they produced double digit increases in the number of chips produced. And although there were some shortages in the auto sector, they were driven primarily by purchasing uh, decisions in the auto sector rather than uh, supply issues uh, in, in the chip industry more generally. And so um, I, I think the fact that we're able to produce uh, vastly more chips at the end of the pandemic than we were able to produce at the start of the pandemic suggests that the supply chains actually work quite well. Um, where I worry about supply chain resiliency is is in the is in the sphere of geopolitical shocks that um, market actors can't really take seriously. I can't really um, plan for, and, and above all, that means large scale wars. Uh, we've seen with the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, the dislocations, and even a comparatively small war on the 
world stage can cause. And uh, it's not hard to imagine situations in East Asia that could be much more uh, damaging. And so what I think uh, the role of allies and partners uh, really can be is thinking through a what are the really severe risks in supply chains that that private firms can't manage and taking into account that all of the companies we're talking about have, uh, have, in many cases, dozens of staff working on supply chain issues full time already. So they, we need to think about the really high impact, uh, even if they're low probability scenarios that that firms can't plan for, and then work with allies and partners to identify those and find workarounds um, for them. And that I think is the the key task of of conversations with allies and partners. But I think we need to be very uh, deliberate in separating the question of normal business operations, in which case there are always fires in factories and issues with shipping. That's an issue the private sector has an excellent track record in sorting out versus the security risks, the geopolitical crises that private sector firms have difficulty predicting and uh, more importantly, have difficulty responding to. And that's a place where government can play a bigger role. Jonas, uh, thank you, Chris, for that. Um, Jonas, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on this as well and, and to hear if you view the clean energy sector to be different in any cases, um, or maybe bouncing off of what Chris just said, maybe what some of those risks that you see uh, within the clean energy sector that perhaps we can work together with allies and partners to address. I mean, one of the, you know, I don't know if it's a difference, but I think one of the important features of the clean energy space is that there is a sort of clock that we're working with, right? If we are trying to um, fix this climate problem, then we have a certain amount of time left to really turn things around. And so to rebuild or build up these supply chains, el uh, chains elsewhere and reduce dependence, for instance, on uh, imported products is, is a great idea, but it also means um, we can't do it overnight and so we're going to have to work with with others to some degree uh, to keep installing wind and solar to kind of continue um, and accelerate in many ways uh, the transition away from fossil fuels and so what that means is that um, even as uh, the U.S. is now, um, you know, much more ambitious and kind of aggressive in pushing a domestic kind of industrialization in this space and the Europeans are too, I think it's important to not forget that there is this broader urgent problem that we're all trying to solve and that problem doesn't really care about where the solar panels were manufactured and so in some ways um, we have to get comfortable with having a dual approach we can invest in domestic competitiveness for these firms but it doesn't mean we can close our borders tomorrow because it's going to take some time and it also means we can't have these competitive races with our partners in europe and elsewhere um, because they also are now tempted to sort of do this Thing on their own and try to kind of bring all these supply chains back and i think that's really important um, to remember it's going to be unlikely that we are going to be completely self-sufficient in these industries and it's also unlikely and even more unlikely that that will happen anytime soon and so we have to figure out a way to kind of invest in domestic industrial competitiveness while also maintaining these relationships with others and the last thing i would add to that is that it goes beyond sort of the traditional partners um, and bears a huge opportunity also for developing countries that so far are just included in these industries essentially as locations of very extractive processes of mineral mining and so on and i think there's a big um you know opportunity for the us to play a role in, in helping um, others participate in these industries and in, in, in kind of developmental ways that would help help their national economies uh, and the pie is only going to grow in these industries so we don't we can be quite generous i think with allocating different different slices of it so i think that's kind of the danger in these industries and i think it's perhaps a little bit different from the others in the sense that the kind of climate question looming over us um, in, in kind of an urgent way excellent well Thank you all. We've we've started out this discussion talking about some higher level, broader questions about uh, industrial policy, what it looks like, what makes a unique industrial policy uh, in America. Um, and now we're going to move on to looking at more of the tools that we have and looking at more of the implementation side. So I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Emily Jin, uh, who's on the economics, energy and security team here at CNAS. Emily, over to you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And uh, I'll be steering the second half of the 
report launch and discussion today to, as Alexandra mentioned, the toolkit, but also the implementation of industrial policy in the United States. Though just before I do so, I want to remind everyone in the audience that you're welcome to ask any questions in the chat box right below this video on cnes.org slash live, or you can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag CNAS2022. And we'll be saving a couple of minutes at the end of this event uh, for audience questions. And uh, thank you all again for participating and let's dive back into the discussion. So uh, just to set the scene a little bit, um, in the last year, they ha there has really been a sea change in the US government's acceptance for industrial policy measures, given some historic passages in enactment of legislation. Um, and I'm just listing off a couple that I can think of right now, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. And they all have components that really strive toward a focused industrial policy strategy. So my, my first question, which I think I'll go to Jonas first, then Chris and Ryan, uh, what are some of the gaps in uh, US industrial policy in each uh, of your sectoral industrial policy case studies? Uh, is, is there a funding gap perhaps, maybe a skills gap or a gap in data and information on the value chain for these sectors? And how may these recent legislation uh, address these gaps, assuming that they do? So I'll, I'll go to Jonas first. Uh, that's a difficult question. And it was a difficult report to write because I feel like we were uh, sort of writing as things were changing quite drastically mm -hmm. and rapidly around us uh, this summer. Um, I think one of the, the things that I said earlier applies here as well. I think that we had sort of this industrial policy approach of um, identifying market failures and, and innovation and investing in those and, and, and realizing that uh, markets for these new technologies wouldn't spring up without um, some government support because these technologies in, in clean energy weren't competitive yet with uh, the technologies that we're trying to replace. Um, and that didn't yield these domestic uh, manufacturing outcomes that, that we wanted to see here. And, and um, I think that really goes uh, or sort of identifies these broader issues in manufacturing in the US. And one of them is a the funding gap. And there were some proposals, for instance, uh, this IFCUS proposal that was, uh, was floated not, uh, not this summer, but the summer before um, to essentially create um, a kind of a lending institution, something like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, but for manufacturing businesses and sectors of the economy that were not served by the current financial system. Um, these new uh, legislations, so the Inflation Reduction Act in this particular uh, case, has included some funding for precisely these issues. So, you know, loan guarantee authority and, and, and sort of the ability of the Department of Energy in particular to intervene there. Um, it falls short in some ways of a kind of an institutional fix, right? Like the bill came through reconciliation, so it was budget related. Um, it didn't create a new um, institution that would kind of address this in clean energy, but maybe beyond clean energy and other sectors. I think you mentioned workforce. I think that's a huge question still. Um, if we're really going to grow um, these industries, um, you know, at the pace at which we have to in order to actually meet these local content requirements that are included in the Inflation Reduction Act for sort of the requirements to qualify for these different tax credits for clean energy technologies. There'll be a lot of jobs in these sectors. It's unclear at this point who's going to train these workers, where they will come from, if we can maybe mm -hmm. uh, you know, create these jobs in places where people are also losing jobs in other sectors and sort of create a just transition in that sense. And so, um, so I think we've begun to address these things, but I think they're, the way that we are doing it currently or that the administration is doing it currently still falls short of kind of an institutional fix that would you know, do this in the long run and in a broad way um, beyond these particular industries. Um, and so I think there's still work to be done, even as things are improving. And I, I don't want to be one of the people criticizing that because I think you know, I'm very excited about this change, but I think you know, mm. let's, let's keep going and let's stay ambitious. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris, do you also think there's room for improvement in specifically your sector of focus? I guess you will be probably thinking about the Chips and Science Act. Well, I think the gaps that you mentioned, Emily, are the right ones to think about. The funding gap, I think, is is being addressed uh, via the money appropriated via the Chips and Science Act. But you also mentioned uh, an information or an analytical gap uh, and then a, a personnel gap. And I think both of these are, are worth thinking hard about. On the personnel side, uh, 
you know, it's one thing to say you want to build up certain segments of an industry uh, in the U.S. And, and put funding towards them. And that's uh, important if you want to do that. But you also need people who, who know the sphere in, in, in question. And uh, in many parts of, I think, all the industries we're probably talking about, but certainly in the semiconductor space, they're really specialized types of knowledge that are difficult to um, difficult to build unless you're working in a firm in that sphere. And in the semiconductor space, when it comes to uh, chip fabrication, um, because a lot of the capacity uh, for producing chips now is in other countries, the workforce is also in other countries as well. And so trying to build uh, manufacturing capacity requires not only building the facilities, but also finding and training uh, workers uh, to work in them. And for many of these spheres, that's not an easy task because the uh, disciplines in question take years to, to master. And so in addition to thinking about um, actual manufacturing capacity, we also have to think about how do you produce the workforce specifically uh, tuned for those facilities. And that's something that will require more partnerships, not only between government and firms, but also universities and firms thinking about uh, not just how to produce uh, smart scientists or smart engineers, but also how to give them the specific skill sets that will be useful uh, in in those types of companies. Secondly, on the on the information or analytical gap that you mentioned, Emily, I think this is a really important um, uh, facet to think about, especially for government, because often it's the case that the government has a really severe um, information and analytical gap to start with. Um, the reality is that there are um, limited pockets of expertise in government, in um, in the semiconductor industry, and probably that's true for all the industries we're discussing. Where there is expertise, it's often quite deep, but it's um, it's not broadly spread around the government. And so when Congress is trying to craft legislation, for example, or um, parts of the bureaucracy are implementing uh, legislation or regulations, they've got a limited pool on which to draw. And this is really important because you need to be drawing on the right information in order to make uh, good policy. So I think there's a lot of space for government to increase its analytical capacity when it comes to advanced technologies across the board. And that's that's where we ought to be starting, because unless we, we're starting with the right information in government, we're not going to make the right policy around it. Thank you so much, Chris. I feel like you, both you and Jonas uh, have touched on uh, like one big theme, which is the uh, well, there's a lot of promising legislative developments right now in the United States. There has to be kind of a longer time horizon planning, uh, which will be quite difficult to address all of these gaps. And I wonder if Ryan feels the same way or maybe differently uh, from uh, doing the case study on biotechnology. Most definitely. Uh, we have a personnel recruitment and retention problem in biotechnologies and in science and technology more broadly in the United States. I think that's a fair thing to say. Um, having enough well-trained and qualified personnel working at laboratories, at agricultural research stations, at medical institutions is the single greatest bottleneck that is throttling, I think, really explosive growth in the U.S. bioeconomy today. I also think that this is an area where the People's Republic of China has made the most progress uh, through formal and through informal talent recruitment initiatives and scholarships. Uh, in his reading of the government work report over the weekend, Xi Jinping emphasized how important recruiting the world's high-end talent is uh, to China, to the Chinese Communist Party, and how central that's going to be over the next decade. And I think that's something that the U.S. government also ought to be paying attention to. Um, there's been some public reporting uh, that nationwide universities in the United States already are producing far fewer STEM PhDs every year uh, than universities in the PRC. Uh, and this is especially true and even more pronounced in the biomedical sciences. And the question I think is what to do about it. Um, one of the recommendations that I offered in Regenerate uh, is that Congress should really codify this recent expansion in the STEM optional training program uh, to support longer term immigration pathways for people that are looking to stay in the United States. Uh, but I also think that Folks are aware of the limitations on the visa processing system, the exorbitant wait times that exist at many embassies and consulates around the world. Um, and streamlining that process, I think, ought to be a, a priority for the Biden administration moving forward uh, and already seems to be top of mind, uh, given the comments made by National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, and remarks made in the National Security Strategy. 
So it seems like we have quite a lot of uh, gaps that we've identified. Um, and perhaps I'll shift the questioning a little bit to uh, specific implementation. Um, and in terms of order, I think I'll probably approach Chris first, uh, then Jonas, and then Ryan on this. So uh, does the US government have sufficient authorities to really effectively craft and implement industrial policy, or uh, are new capacities ultimately needed? So an example that I can think of in terms of authorities are uh, the Defense Protection Act, which the United States has quite recently used uh, for filling the shortage of baby formula and uh, production of COVID vaccines. Um, and perhaps a related question is, in addition to whether the U.S. government having uh, sufficient authorities, is there enough analytical capacity, which we are we've already alluded to before, within the U.S. government to aggregate uh, data of distinct value chains, um, project future trajectories, and inform industrial policy making in the long run. Um, so, with this big question, perhaps, so I'll go to Chris first. Especially curious of your opinion on whether the U.S. government, from your research on the uh, global history of semiconductor industry and knowledge, um, your knowledge on the U.S. semiconductor industry development, is there sufficient analytical capacity, and uh, whether you want to comment on current U.S. Uh, capacity or authorities in addressing this? Yeah, thanks, Emily. I think on the the authority question, the answer is is yes. There's a bunch of different policy tools that the U.S. government has in the semiconductor space, and you mentioned the Defense Production Act, which is something that the U.S. Uh, has, gives the U.S. government really drastic power in the, over the economy, uh, which it hasn't used in the semiconductor space for um, of, for some time. And I'm trying to think of an example if it's ever used it in the semiconductor space. I'm not sure of one off the top of my head. Um, so I don't think the question of legal power, legal authorities is, is the limiting factor here. I think there's a question of um, political consensus over what is the problem we're trying to solve and how severe is it, and therefore what resources should we devote to it. And then second on, Analytical, the analytical capacity, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. This is a, a really hard problem to deal with. And, and in all the industries we're discussing, certainly in semiconductors, the question of where will the industry be in five years time or in 10 years time uh, is an answer that we can never be sure of. Uh, no one knows uh, because mm -hmm. uh, A, because it's hard to predict the future in general, but B, because this industry is changing very, very fast as it always has. And the, the pace set by Moore's law uh, of exponential growth and computing power every couple of years uh, means that semiconductors change more rapidly than almost any other part of the economy. Uh, and so that makes it very difficult to, uh, to craft predictions about the future around which we can have high confidence. And if you look at uh, companies uh, which are investing in the semiconductor space over a five or 10 year uh, time horizon, they have different perspectives as to what the future will bring. If you look at venture capital firms who are also investing over a similar, similar time horizon, uh, they have different predictions. So the, the U.S. government has to be really humble and modest in its uh, in its uh, expectation of how accurate its predictions will be. Um, but it also has to, I think, leverage the expertise in the private sector about where the industry is, is going. And that's where um, taking in lots of information from private sector actors is going to be absolutely crucial to the success of any industrial policy. Now, there's a balance that must be struck because the more information that is taken in from private sector actors, the more risk there is that um, a, a small number of private sector actors uh, have undue influence over how government officials uh, conceptualize the problem or um, devise their solutions. But the reality is the more contact, I think, between government and industry, the more successful um, policy is is likely to be. And that's true both in the question of how do you predict the future direction and thereby influence it, also true in the uh, question of understanding and, uh, and de-risking supply chains, where in the semiconductor space, making an advanced chip already requires um, dozens and really hundreds of companies, uh, thousands of process steps stretching ac across at least three continents for almost every chip that's made. So it's immensely complex. Uh, and the only way we can really understand it is by having deep um, multifaceted connections with players in industry who are dealing with this on a granular basis every day. And so I think the more that government agencies in the Commerce Department and elsewhere uh, interface with industry and understand um, how the industry looks from their particular subsector, uh, the more likely they are to craft effective policy towards this industry. Thank you so much, Chris. And I'll go to Jonas next, um, but it might be a little bit tricky for you given that clean energy technology includes so many different clean energy technologies. So if you'd like to talk about maybe the analytical capacity of either a subset, or you could take on a more challenging commentary, which is on the full 
full uh, spectrum. So I want to build on something that Chris just mentioned, which which I think sort of applies in these industries in, in a slightly different way. Um, this idea of political consensus around goals, I think, is really important um, in yet another way, because, you know, passing industrial policy also means soliciting information and changing policy very frequently, depending on how quickly industry meets the goals, whether those goals were too hard or too easy in the first place. And so you have to act on the analytical capacity that you have. And so I agree with him that this sort of interface with industry is incredibly important for soliciting this kind of information. And there's a whole classic sort of social science literature on industrial policy that tells us that, that is the case. The problem in the US is that a lot of policy gets passed as these one-off epic legislations that sort of eke through the finish line. And there's very little opportunity then to go back and say, okay, so we passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Maybe these local content requirements were too ambitious or maybe they weren't ambitious enough. Well, how do we change them? And so in this political environment, I think it's very hard for us to be nimble in that way and act on that information. Um, and so I don't have an easy fix for, for that kind of problem, but I just want to sort of flag that as an additional um, as an, an additional issue and, and places that have been very successful in using industrial policy to kind of advance, advance domestic industrial development have often used a lot of feedback loops and a lot of kind of experiments and then acted on these experiments and tweaking the policy further. And I think that should be one of our goals to be nimble policymakers of that kind um, in order to actually take that expertise and the information we can solicit from industry and then you know improve the policy that we have. And if the Inflation Reduction Act is the last thing we pass on climate for the next 20 years, it's going to be very difficult to respond to that kind of real world feedback that we will get on these policies going forward. Thank you so much. Uh, similar question for Ryan, uh, but like, does the United States government have current, uh, sufficient authorities to ad address or implement industrial policy in biotechnology? And also, uh, can you comment on the current analytical capacity within the US government on that? Yeah, this is, I think, an essential question. And frankly, I think it's more about capacity than authority. Um, I, I think that there were essentially three capacities that the USG ought to be in, trying to improve and hone uh, to, to do industrial policy well with respect to biotech. First, um, I think the government ought to reclaim its historical role as a distributor of resources. Um, and, and keeping in mind the American tradition, this ought to be about promoting equity of opportunity rather than equality. And this isn't always going to be about money and just doling out cash. Uh, some of the recommendations that I made in the report were to create, for example, a national research cloud for distributing access to cloud computing power for researchers and for enterprises. Uh, you should probably do the same thing, for example, with um, genomic data. Uh, I recommended as well that the National Institutes of Health create a national gene bank that's equivalent, or, or that's equipped rather for uh, uh, 21st century uh, genomic research. Uh, so I think building this capacity to distribute resources and thinking in outside of the box resources that aren't always just capital uh, is, is going to be essential. Um, the second area I think we ought to be improving though is by establishing technical literacy. Um, so you were talking about analytic capacity. Uh, frankly, we need more scientists in government. Um, one of the things I recommend in the report as well is to establish a BioCore scholarship for service, similar to the existing CyberCore. Uh, we need more biologists to be entering the US government, uh, advising uh, folks on, on what kinds of policies are appropriate, what kinds of technologies uh, are most essential, uh, where we should be directing investments and, and other questions like that. Um, and without even basic technical understanding, uh, I think a lot of conversations around biotechnologies uh, tend to get stovepiped into conversations about weapons of mass destruction, for example. Uh, that was a, a comment I made in the report uh, observing uh, how the United States approached biotechnology during the Cold War. Uh, so those are, I think, two areas uh, where the U.S. government ought to be thinking about new kinds of capacity building that it probably does already have the authority to implement. Thank you so much, Ryan. I actually just got inspired as uh, you guys were answering the questions about capacity. Um, 
like I, I feel all of your case studies and perhaps in your foundational research for your case studies, you've studied comparatively what some of the other economies have done um, in, in their specific sectors. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll direct this question to Chris first, uh, but uh, Jonas and Ryan, if you both have thoughts on this uh, regarding uh, your respective industries, uh, would welcome you to jump in after as well. So like, what are some lessons that the United States could take away um, from some other, uh, from in making industrial policy, policies from other economies. And I think Chris, uh, not just in your case study, but in your book as well, you've uh, provided some case studies or comparisons, for example, from uh, economies like Taiwan and Japan. So would appreciate your comments on that. Well, I think this gets back to the question of, of what industrial policy is trying to accomplish. And Jonas mentioned at the outset that many of our foundational uh, examples of industrial policy come from late industrializing countries in East Asia, which are trying to catch up to a cutting edge. And in the chip industry, we've certainly seen uh, uh, several countries uh, pursue catch up strategies, uh, some successfully, uh, some less so, um, largely in East Asia and, and Taiwan or South Korea are great examples of successful industrial policy where government plus private firms work to catch up to capabilities that were um, that were uh, available elsewhere and eventually even exceed those capabilities in certain cases. But I think this is probably less relevant for the US in most spheres because we're not in a, uh, a state of trying to catch up except in, in, in discrete areas to a technological frontier, but rather to push forward the frontier and the types of policies that will work and catch up are just different than ones that we have to expect will work on the technological frontier. So we've got to differentiate our heads first, which, which, um, which type of uh, industrial policy situation uh, we're talking about. I think the other lesson from the chip industry, and I'm not sure if it's uh, relevant in, in other spheres, is that certain um, industrial policies look successful if they set the goal of expanding capacity and then spend a lot of money to build capacity. And the reality is that it's easy to build capacity if you've got a lot of money. Uh, and so there's plenty of examples in, uh, in the history of East Asian industrial policy, but also more broadly of government setting a goal of expanding capacity uh, allotting a lot of funds to it and then building capacity, whether that produces profitable businesses or new technology um, or an effective commercial ecosystem is a very different question. But if your goal is simply to produce more at home, you can buy your way to that goal. Probably not a smart thing to do, but certainly a possible thing to do. But that's why I think um, in, in the case of chips, we shouldn't define the goal as percentage of X produced in the United States. That's not a effective metric. Mm -hmm. I think we should define the goal as do we have uh, leading businesses in the United States that are pushing the technological frontier? And then are we comfortable with the geographic distribution of the supply chain? Are there risks that we uh, simply can't uh, tolerate? And none of those are about hitting certain production targets uh, in the US per se. Um, we know the industrial policy tools that would be needed to achieve those goals, but it's just not the right way to conceptualize what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you so much. And uh, Jonas, do you also have some uh, thoughts on or lessons that you've uh, taken away or the United States should take away from some other economies or perhaps uh, what the United States should not do? Um, because there's also negative examples. Well, it seems like in the in the industries that I've looked at for my uh, case studies, so, uh, you know, wind, solar storage, uh, the U.S. in some ways is catching up uh, with with other countries, right? So we we are very much behind in terms of manufacturing capacity, even behind other rich economies with high manufacturing wages. And so something went wrong clearly in the process here. We didn't get as much domestic returns on our investment. And so there are some lessons we can we can learn. And I think there are interesting approaches out there. I think one is this financing question that keeps coming up. Um, and I think that's a, a big one to solve for, for manufacturing domestically. Um, there's been a lot of finger pointing at China for uh, sort of state development banks lending to the solar and battery industry, for instance. But I think a big innovation in China was that these companies were able to raise capital for manufacturing expansion in a way that was really difficult to do in the United States. And, you know, in some ways, understandably so, there are higher returns for financial institutions and other industries. Um, the European Union is sort of very much focused on coordination in the battery space and trying to make sure that domestic companies are sort of, you know, acquainted with and slotted in different parts of the supply chain where they have skills that they might be able to apply. And so this sort of continent-wide kind of coordination strategy is another sort of idea that we might 
uh, want to learn from and adapt for local circumstances. I don't think any of this is sort of a direct one for one institutional borrowing, but I think there are approaches that we can think about and, and figure out how some of what these things accomplish elsewhere in the world um, could be created here with very different institutions, of course, in a very different kind of political system. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I see that Ryan is already jumping in, uh, ready to answer the question. <laughs> but Ryan, if you have any thoughts on uh, uh, application in the biotechnology sector. Yeah, I, I wanted to jump in and say, you know, for, for, for lessons learned from others, uh, I think it's clear that as the United States tries to do industrial policy, it shouldn't be a money bag and it shouldn't be a choke point. Uh, when I say money bag, you know, there's been a lot of public reporting, uh, Chris's book does a good job of explaining as well, some of the bloating and corruption, uh, for example, in the PRC semiconductor industry, that kind of efficiency and those misaligned incentives are things that the United States probably would want to avoid. Uh, but it also shouldn't be a, a bottleneck or a choke point picking winners and losers. Uh, I think a, a better model to aspire to is to be a flashlight kind of generally pointing and shining a light in the direction that we want technology development to go, prioritizing certain industries, illuminating the barriers and the objects yet ahead, uh, but enabling industry to navigate around them in the way that it best sees possible. Uh, and also to conceptualize uh, the kind of infusion of capital that we're talking about uh, as grease in the machine, helping companies uh, bridge the valley of death, uh, not trying to uh, pull them up and create them uh, artificially in, in ways that are ham-fisted and oftentimes ineffectual. Thank you all so much. And uh, we have just a little bit of time left at the end uh, for some audience questions. A lot of them touch on similar themes. So I'll just pick out one from Michael here from the audience. It's directed at Quiris, but uh, I think it actually applies across the board if anyone is inclined to answer first. But uh, Chris, you alluded to the possibility that a geopolitical crisis would spur some cooperation with allied governments uh, on industrial policy. In light of current geopolitical threats, uh, some obvious ones are uh, Russia, potentially China, et cetera. Uh, do you think allies should preemptively coordinate their industrial policy? And uh, what would that coordination look like? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. And if we look at the, the Russia-Ukraine war, I think it's obvious that we wish we'd coordinated more with Europe, and I think we wish Europe would coordinate coordinated more with us on their energy supply. Um, and certainly there were proposals actually uh, over the past couple of years to, for example, ship more US LNG to Europe and have Europe rely uh, less on Russian gas. So this is a clear example of where coordination in advance could have um, could have reduced the cost of, of Russia's use of the energy weapon against Europe this winter. And I think when we think about comparable risks vis-a-vis -vis China, here too, we've got to be thinking about ways we can coordinate with allies to preemptively uh, address and mitigate the scale of the risks. Now, obviously, our economies are far more intertwined with China's, so uh, it's not that we're going to completely um, uh, reduce the risk of, uh, of, of conflict impacting uh, trade flows or investment flows. But I think we, we can be deliberate in thinking about what are the, the key risks where we most expose to potential um, Chinese pressure and what can we do with allies to reduce our reliance, to diversify our supplies, uh, and to ensure that China's got fewer tools uh, to coerce us or allies like the Russians have used against Germany and other Europeans uh, in the energy space. And uh, Jonas and Ryan, do you guys have particular additional thoughts on this? And I know we're yeah, actually coming. Oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> Do I have 30 Sorry. seconds? I think one, one thing I might quickly <laughs> add before we, we jump off, uh, you know, would be sort of thinking about the trade rules more broadly and kind of maintaining an open trade trading system mm -hmm. and being a productive member of it. I mean, the U.S. has been fighting against local content regulations for a long time, very aggressively, especially against Chinese use of them. And now we have them in the Inflation Reduction Act. How do we sort of make sure that, um, you know, this doesn't kind of spiral down uh, in that direction in a way that wouldn't be productive, especially since we need um, supplies from other parts of the world for the foreseeable future to meet to meet domestic demand for these things. And so I think one way to coordinate with allies and others would be to kind of figure out a way in which this domestic support for industrial competitiveness can be still um, compatible with um, 
you know, open flows of, of products across borders. Thank you so much, Jonas. And uh, I think on that note, I just wanted, I want to respect everyone's time. So we're going to have to wrap up this great conversation. So I want to thank all of our panelists for providing their insightful comments on the strategic implications and also the implementation of industrial policy in the United States. And for those of you in the audience, thank you so much for spending this past hour with us. And we hope you enjoy reading through all of our reports on industrial policy. And we encourage you to continue to follow along as CNAS continues research efforts on industrial policy. And thank you for spending your time with us today.